Hi, today I'm going to talk about the Aruda Boys Hyperelastic Material Mall. This is a material mall that was developed almost 30 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been so long and it has been super successful. A lot of uh, publications have been devoted to this kind of mall. It's available in all finite element softwares. It has more than 3000 citations right now. It's, it's incredible. Um, it was developed by uh, Aruda and Boys when they were at MIT, and I happened to be at MIT uh, just a little bit after they developed this model. So it came from the same research group that I came from. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about what this model is all about and what makes it interesting. Um, the key here is this model is actually micromechanism inspired. It has a, a picture of what's going on in the polymer as it's being deformed, and that's then used to develop this hyperelastic material model. And one of the key assumptions in this model is what's written here, that the molecules on average in the material are considered to be located along the diagonals of a unit cell, but this unit cell has to be oriented in principal stretch space. So in uniaxial loading and biaxial loading, the principal stretch space is the same as the applied stress space. So that's easy to understand. But in shear, the, there is a difference because they are rotated relative to each other. But let's take a look at uniaxial tension first. So here is the, the idea that these molecules are along the diagonal of a little cube that sits in the material. If you take this cube and pull on it, what this model says is that the molecules will then rotate with this cube. And so they will be stretched on average and they will rotate towards the direction in which the cube was pulled. And that makes a lot of sense. That's intuitive. That's what the molecules will do. Uh, what's interesting, though, is if you think about it in compression, if you take uniaxial compression, you take a specimen and you just squeeze it down, you pancake it, what happens then is, well, according to this theory, the molecules will be stretched out too because this cube is stretched out. They just that the molecules will be rotating in a, into a direction that's perpendicular to the compression direction. So the idea here in this model is that the molecules are never compressed. They're always stretched. And what makes a difference here is in which directions the molecules are stretched during the applied deformation. And to me, this makes a lot of sense. And it's kind of an interesting idea to think about deformation of a material that has these long macromolecules, which polymers have. Um, to make this a little more mathematical, we need to assign some equations here and work a little bit that way. So if we take one of these molecules, the red one here, and we look at how much does a molecule like that stretch if you deform this cube, this unit cell that we're considering. So we assign these stretch ratios, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. And the actual stretch of this molecule itself will be given by this equation, simply by the stretch of the cube. And mathematically, that's the same as the square root of the I1 invariant divided by 3. So this is one way to prove that this Aruda Boys hyperelastic model is an I1 based hyperelastic model, in fact. And there is this relationship within the molecular stretch according to this uh, me micromechanism model and the applied deformations in, in this tensor form I1 star. Um, you can then do a little bit more math and you can prove that the Cauchy stress, the true stress in the material, would be given by this equation. This is all the quantities we talked about, except that it needs one more thing. It needs to know how much the free energy in the material changes as the molecules are being stretched out. And that's, that's kind of something you can derive if you take into consideration uh, free chain mechanics and polymer of um, chemistry and physics. The people have figured out how much force it takes to pull on the molecule and stretching it out. So we can use that information in this equation. And if you do that, the final equation for the stress of the Aruda Boys hyperelastic model is this one. This is the Cauchy stress. There are three material parameters in, in these red boxes here, mu, lambda log, and kappa. Mu gives the initial shear modulus, kappa is the bulk modulus, and lambda log is the stretch at which, the molecular stretch at which the uh, material becomes infinitely stiff. And then it has this weird function L minus one. This is a function that's called the inverse Langevin function. And it can't be expressed in elementary functions, but the, the, the traditional Langevin function is given by this. The inverse is just the inverse of this. So you need to solve that inverse in some way. There are different ways to do it. 
what I want to do is to show you a little bit how this model works, how easy it's to work with this uh, Aruda Voice hyperelastic model. So here is a blank M calibration window. And um, the way I will do this is I will uh, add some experimental data. In the, the current version of M calibration, you can add experimental data by clicking on the virtual load case button, then set experimental data, and I'm going to select natural rubber. This is data from Trellor back in the day. It has uniaxial uh, tension, biaxial tension, and pure shear. And I'm going to select the Ruta Boys hyperelastic model now. And I'm just going to use the PolyUmod version of it. All finite element models, as I mentioned, has this implemented. I select this, and then I can just run it. And if I want to, I can calibrate this one from this point. And it takes a few seconds to finish. And it does it in an iterative way. And once it's done, you should be able to see a good agreement with the experimental data. So here it is. Uh, it predicts the different loading modes relatively well. Um, since this material model, this hyperelastic material model, is only I1 based, there is no I2 dependence in it, we tend to underpredict the biaxial stress. But otherwise, it's a good model for large strain response. It's always stable, and uh, therefore I like it. So let's summarize. So in summary, uh, this model is easy to use, easy to calibrate, always stable. And it's used very frequently as a building block in more advanced viscoplastic material models. The only downside really is that it uh, uh, underpredicts the stress in biaxial loading sometimes. So that's uh, something that usually isn't that important. But if that's something really important for your application, then you may want to look at a different hyperelastic material model. But I really like this model. I use it a lot. And if you have any questions about this, you can ask them below.